Hey folks, thanks for joining us today. Um, it's just now noon here in the Midwest. Uh, so I'm gonna launch a couple uh, questions for y'all just to kind of get a feel for who is in our audience while people continue to trickle in. So the first one is, uh, where are you all from um, around the country? And I'm only only allowed to do uh, five options, so sorry if your region's not included. Um, you can go ahead and if your area is not in there, you can drop it in the questions panel, uh, which should be on the right side of your screen. All right, so it looks like oh, we have someone joining us from London, UK. Wow. That's the cool. Isaac Walton League of America and UK. Um, all right, so it looks like almost 90% of the audience has voted. Uh, we've got about 20% of people from the Northeast, about 30 from the Mid Atlantic, 46% of you are from the Midwest, and then an uh, additional 2% from the South and 2 from the West. So that's great. We've got a little bit of geographic uh, variety going on for us. And then we've got someone across the sea. Mm. I'm going to close this one and I've got one more for you. What is your uh, level of background or experience in this type of stuff? <clears throat> We're going to be talking specifically um, about water quality issues, um, but if you do advocacy and uh, other areas or you work in natural resources um, that'd be great to know and again if you feel like you don't really fit in with any of those or you want to expand on other if you if you answered that you can drop that in the questions panel as well got somebody who is an environmental science teacher. Awesome. All right, so about 85% of us have voted and almost half of you answered the first one saying this is your job. 15% uh, voted for the second option saying you've done some volunteer work before. Uh, about a quarter of us are active volunteers or members of an organization. 9% said the fourth option, you're new and just trying to learn, and 2% answered other. All right, so I'm gonna close that. Um, Paul, you can pull your uh, presentation up right now. We can see your upcoming slides if you just wanna open up your presentation. Okay. Um, but while he's doing that, that looks good, Paul. Uh, I'll just do some housekeeping stuff. So welcome to our webinar. This is hosted by the Isaac Walton League of America. Um, the webinar is being recorded and a recording of this will be posted on YouTube and you'll get a link to that recording when it's available. It should be available within the next day or two. And so we'll send that link to you if you're interested in watching or sharing afterwards. You also, some of you may have already found the <clears throat> questions panel. Um, we don't have a traditional chat function like you might be familiar with in Zoom. But if you have questions throughout the webinar, you can type them in there and they'll go to me and I can read those out at the end. We'll do a Q&A session after Paul and Sue have done their presentations. Uh, if it's something that I know I'm able to answer, um, then I can also just answer that privately to you during the presentation. But um, without further ado, I know these guys have some good stuff to share with you. So I'm going to get out of the way and I will be... Um, muted and have my camera off but i'll still be in the background helping moderate stuff um, so go ahead and send those questions in as they come up throughout the presentations and we will bring them up at the end so i'm going to pass it off to paul paul is our um, regional conservation coordinator with the missouri river initiative um, with the isaac walton league over here in the midwest so paul go ahead and get started all right 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this uh, fine day. It's a windy day. I'm living in Pierce, South Dakota, and it's always windy in South Dakota, it seems, but the uh, last couple of days, extremely so. We had a wind gust of 75 miles an hour in Rapid City yesterday, and it blew over 60 miles an hour here in Pierre yesterday. So uh, springtime weather systems coming through and letting themselves be known. Uh, as Zach said, I head up the League's Missouri River Initiative, uh, which was formed in 2007 by the Isaac Walton League divisions in Iowa, Nebraska, and South Dakota. And uh, the focus of the program is, as the name implies, deals with the Missouri River, in particular, uh, Missouri River management, uh, which includes two invasive or two endangered species, which I'll talk about uh, later in the presentation, overall management of the river by the Corps of Engineers, uh, how to prevent the spread of invasive species, uh, river cleanups, which I'll focus on in, in the latter part of this presentation, and then just to raise people's awareness of the Missouri River and the issues the river is facing. Uh, part of my responsibilities, I've been a member of the Missouri River Recovery Implementation Committee, which is a mouthful to say, so we just call it Mr. Rick for short. I've been a member of that uh, Federal Advisory Committee since its uh, formation in October of 2008. And talk a little bit about uh, advocacy, first of all, and uh, how to make a difference in your area or in your state. And at times you think that it's an uphill struggle as the, the caricature on the left-hand side of your screen shows. It seems like it's a, a steep climb or uh, something that you really can't make much difference or, or try to make an impact uh, with that. But uh, hopefully I'll be able to tell you that there is a way that you can do that. And uh, you can make a difference on water quality issues and make a difference in the environment in your area. Now I'm, it's frozen up on me, Zach. Suggestion to get it to move. Paul, do you want me to just uh, try sharing my screen? It might be easier, yeah. Okay. I don't know if it's a bandwidth deal or... I'm not sure what it would be. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Um, and then you just let me know when you click through to the next slide. So stay with us for a second, folks, while we get that figured out. Let's see if I can get it to, need to minimize this too. All right. Okay, Paul, we should be good to go now. I'm on that same slide that you were on. Okay, I apologize for the technical snafu there. Go ahead and advance it. Gonna talk about uh, state legislators. Uh, legislative session just concluded here in South Dakota. Uh, Wherever you're at, if you're interested in water quality and legislative efforts in regards to water in your state, urge you to, if you're not already, to become familiar with your state legislator's uh, website or the state in, uh, in South Dakota's case, for example, it's the uh, South Dakota Legislative Research Council or LRC. They have a website and it tracks all the uh, legislation that's been introduced, uh, and then the status of the bills that have been introduced, where they're at in the legislative process. And it can be kind of daunting this year, for example, in the small state that I live in, small in population anyway, uh, over 550 pieces of legislation were introduced in a 37-day legislative session. So uh, trying to keep tabs of all those bills and all those measures is pretty daunting. 
you can speed up the process by uh, most of these sites have a search function where you can enter keywords into your search. If you'd want to search uh, lakes, rivers, streams, or clean water, uh, that can help because then the uh, the system will automatically go through the language of all the bills and highlight those that mention those key words. And that can uh, save you a lot of time rather than trying to guess whether uh, this bill by its title will impact something that you care about or not. It's important to uh, look at the bills, look at the language, and gauge the impact of them. And if, if you want to be engaged in the process, determine right away if you uh, would support, oppose, or you're just watching or monitoring that piece of legislation as it moves through the session. Okay, next one. In the legislative process, a bill after it's introduced will be referred to a committee or a subcommittee in the uh, legislature. So you need to know what committee the bill has been referred to. And then secondly, when that bill will be up for a hearing. Every bill has to have a hearing unless the bill is withdrawn by the sponsor after it was originally drafted. That uh, would be the exception to it, not having a, a formal hearing. And if you have questions on the bill, uh, want to learn more about it or uh, indicate either support or opposition to it, find out after it's been referred, find out from the committee members on that committee or subcommittee, their feelings on that piece of legislation. They obviously are going to deal with a list of bills longer than your leg throughout each legislative session. So you will have to update them or brief them on the bill number and what the bill, the intent of the bill is, at least how you see the intent of the bill, and then find out if, if that committee member would support it or oppose it, or if you can provide them with more information or uh, get, give them your feelings on, on the bill and how it would possibly impact an area that you're concerned with. Then another opportunity before the, the bill is uh, too far along in the process, particularly before it has its first hearing. If you know of others that you think would have a stake in this or should be concerned about the impact of this bill, loop them into it and, and uh, tell them what's going on. Engage those other groups or other individuals that may help you either support the bill or oppose the bill as it moves through the process. There's uh, the old adage that there's strength in numbers and the more groups you can get together, particularly the more diverse groups you can get together on a, on a measure, uh, the better, because it, it makes your case for or against much more uh, powerful. And when the bill is up for its hearing, don't be afraid to testify in support of if you like the bill or against it, if you are not a big fan of the bill as written. Uh, it, it that seems rather daunting and intimidating, but uh, it's not as scary as, as you might think. And the uh, committee members will value opinions of, of people that take the effort to testify either in person or uh, remotely by phone or online uh, during the committee hearing on, on uh, your thoughts or your opinions on that piece of legislation. Go ahead, Zach. Important to uh, remember to follow the bill all the way through the entire process. If it comes out of committee the way you want it, uh, hasn't been amended or hasn't been changed, make sure the bill stays in that form because it can be amended very, very quickly at, at any step along the process. So you need to follow it onto the floor of either the House or the Senate, and then it'll be after it passes the initial house of origin it has to cross over to the other side either the house or the senate whichever uh, has not seen it yet and the process starts all over it has to go through be referred to committee go through hearings and then pass that the floor of that other chamber before it moves on and once it passes both chambers then it will go to the governor's desk and just because it passes both the uh, Senate and the House doesn't mean it's over. 
the governor can, for whatever, a whole bevy of reasons, decide that this bill is not worthy of a signature or, or shouldn't become law. So a governor can veto the bill. So it's important to monitor it all the way through its final action, which uh, if, if you want it to pass means a governor's signature so it becomes law. And as Yogi Berra said, it's not over till it's over because sometimes in the final days of the session, a bill that you think has skated right through will be uh, vetoed for whatever reason. It may be uh, a technical error in the bill or uh, something not referenced correctly or uh, simply uh, a typo or some bad language, a grammatical correction. You need to, if you want the bill to pass, follow it all the way through until there there is no more, until the, the bill is signed, if you want it to pass. Same thing if you oppose the bill, it's not over till it's over. You can work on the, uh, on the governor in your state to veto the bill because of the current concerns you have with it. Next one. A couple of uh, successes that the South Dakota division had in the uh, recently completed legislative session here. We supported a bill, House Bill 1256. It was a special appropriations bill that uh, gathered uh, or garnered $3 million in special funding for water quality improvement projects along the Big Sioux River in the Big Sioux watershed in eastern South Dakota. Big Sioux is a river that uh, is on the one of the nation's most impaired water bodies right now. And hopefully the funding from uh, 1256 will go to landowners that wanna do things to improve water quality in, in that river. It's an important water source for several of our major cities in Eastern South Dakota and uh, has tremendous opportunities for recreation. Although water quality is so poor in certain reaches of the river now that uh, they don't even want people to swim or recreate on it because of the, the the pollution that's in the Big Sioux currently. So that's one of the reasons why that bill went through with little or no opposition this year because of the uh, condition that river is it finds itself in right now. Next one. Another bill dealing with water quality that passed uh, again with very little or no opposition in the House and the Senate was signed by the governor was House Bill 1242, that basically just made a few uh, tweaks to an existing buffer strip law in South Dakota. A buffer strip is a is vegetation, uh, native vegetation along a water body or streak, stream or river. And then as water runoff runs through that vegetation, the vegetation filters out pollutants from the runoff before it reaches the stream or the river and it, it improves water quality for not only that area, but everybody obviously downstream. 1042 made the existing buffer strip bill a little more user-friendly. It uh, made it easier for landowners that want to do the right thing on their property that uh, abuts some of these waters in South Dakota, uh, makes it easier for them to participate in the buffer strip program. The uh, bill originally passed in 2017, uh, the original piece of legislation required landowners to enroll every year in the buffer strip program for a, a tax break on that land that they would enroll in this program. And the, the changes to in through 1042 this year changed that annual enrollment to a 10-year agreement. So uh, landowners do not have to go back to the, the county courthouse every year to renew their participation in this program. So Hopefully that's going to increase participation in this program. Next one. I'm going to switch gears here and talk a little bit about uh, river cleanups or water cleanup. It doesn't have to be on a river or a stream. It can be on a lake as well. Go ahead, Zach. It's uh, one thing to have the idea if you're going to do this, but um, if you do a small one, you can do it with little or no set up or organization, but if you want to do a, a major one, and I'll uh, showing you some pictures of some pretty big efforts that I've been in, uh, involved with over the years, it's important to pick a water body that uh, is in close proximity to where you're at because of 
all the uh, the time and effort that this takes and one that you have a, a personal connection to also makes a difference and if, if you spend a lot of time in, on a water body and you see litter and trash and and things that shouldn't be there a uh, river body that a uh, water body that needs some help that's a good candidate for a cleanup go ahead you can't do this alone it's, again if you're especially if you're going to do something of that it's a, a major effort you need partners and the more you can find the better it will be the more successful you will be and as with uh, the advocacy part of it in the legislative process look for groups or organizations or individuals that share your same goal or or what you want to accomplish and that can be uh, people that fish kayak uh, sailboaters uh, people that might might hunt along on that water body um, bird watchers are, are good groups to talk to and anybody that's concerned with water quality are natural for potential partners for this thing and don't forget about uh, youth groups boy scouts girl scouts 4-h clubs they're all always interested in in doing things for the community and uh, for the environment they're another potential uh, good source for the volunteers that you need to make a cleanup successful government entities are important partners make sure that the city and county commissioners know what's going on uh, so in some cases you might need a, a, a permit from them uh, or permission to use a boat a boat launch or uh, a city park for example so that's good to get that done ahead of time long before you're uh, ready to go with this so you have all your ducks in a row and uh, a source that we've been using here in Pier on the Lake Sharp Missouri River cleanup the last several years has been court services. They have people that uh, have done it all and uh, through their through the courts have been assigned to do community service. And one of the community services that qualifies is volunteering for efforts such as our Missouri River cleanup. So we get a, a good bunch of people every year that want to come and, and take the three hours that we do the cleanup and then we sign a document that participated and that accounts for that community service time that they're required to put in from um, the uh, the court that, that sentenced them to that for uh, an infraction or misdemeanor which they were convicted of. So that's another a good use of a good way to find volunteers and a win-win for both the, the water body and the people that uh, are looking for an opportunity to put in that time. And uh, a key group for all the cleanups that I've been involved with is uh, state and federal agencies, the fish and game agency in your state, or in some states they call them uh, DNR. Here they're called uh, South Dakota Game Fish and Parks also work with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission and the Iowa DNR on the cleanups in the three states that I work on in the Missouri River. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, personnel, another good source for this. They're obviously familiar with the waters in, in the region in which they work, and uh, this would fit with, with their service uh, and uh, objectives. And then the Army Corps of Engineers, they're the management agency for the Missouri River, so that's a natural uh, getting them involved in anything that we do on the on the Missouri River. Go ahead, Zach. Put this as a slide. And everybody thinks, well, this has got to be falling off the hog easy to pick a date and say this is the time and day we're doing it. I wish it would be that easy. Uh, when whenever you have multiple partners and multiple entities involved, sometimes the, the toughest thing to do is finding a day and time that's going to work for everybody. Uh, the, and you'll never find one, trust me, you'll never find one that is completely conflict free in, in today's world. But you can, by, by communicating with the partners and, and the key players in this, you can find a day and time that will work for most people, whether you're going to do it uh, a short cleanup as the, the people on the left-hand photo are, or if you're going to do it 
one if by land, two if by sea, as Paul Revere said, if you're going to do it by boat, that takes a, a little more coordination and a little more uh, collaboration has to happen for everybody to see clear and, and uh, find a date and time that will work. Go ahead. People need to know what you're doing. So promotion is, is crucial, especially if you're looking for a lot of volunteers. Uh, utilize the local media, radio, TV, newspaper. Uh, draft a, a good news release with the who, what, when, and why and where. And part and parcel of that has to be a way for people that hear, see, or read this, how they can contact somebody for more information, whether that be you or another one of the organizers. So uh, they can get an email address or phone number and, and get that connection started. Uh, use all forms of social media, podcasts, and a little bit of old school here, but it is effective. Develop a, a small flyer or a poster. doesn't have to be a, a big uh, piece of paper. Eight and a half by 11 works just fine, but telling people what it is, when it is, why they should become involved, and uh, then again, contact information, either the little tear off things at the bottom or they can tear off somebody's email address or a phone number so they can get in touch with you and, and uh, help and, and uh, participate in the, in the uh, effort. And as I said earlier, if you're going to do something major, you need a lot of people to do it. It's, it's a, the more hands you have working on an event, not only do you collect more, but it, it goes quicker and it isn't near as daunting when you have an army, but that again takes a lot of coordination. You need to know what to do with those people, where to send them. We'll talk about that in a minute. But it, if, if you're looking to do something big, you need a lot of people because uh, just the, the volume of work that goes into one of these things. Important to get registration, as much of the pre-registration done by email in advance rather than the day of the event. That greatly helps you in uh, knowing what you need for the event itself for uh, all the logistics uh, so you're prepared you don't want to do an event think you're going to get 20 and then have 150 people show up the day of because you're going to be overwhelmed with just the, the sheer volume of what am i going to do with all these people where are we going to send them so you've got to ha have a feel for uh, what's coming and and uh, what to expect and getting email addresses and phone numbers from those volunteers is really critical to keep them engaged and informed uh, ahead of the cleanup with last minute details and, and uh, updates on what's going on and that things are still scheduled for Saturday morning at eight o'clock or whenever you have set for the cleanup. Go ahead. As I said, you really need to know uh, the body of water in which you're going to work and head or what's out there before the the cleanup starts these are photos uh, from the, a couple of years ago on the uh, Missouri River Lake Sharp cleanup here in Pier and Fort Pier and that's not staged uh, that was an actual those are actual sites with illegal dumping that's been that had happened uh, we had worked on these areas in the past so I drove in there a couple of days ahead of the cleanup just to see what was in on these public land areas and found these two sites. And I thought, all right, and uh, jotted down on a, on a notepad then uh, where the site was, what was there, what was needed to get that stuff out of there. And then when we actually do the cleanup, make sure a, a crew gets there either by boat or by a uh, vehicle, a truck and a trailer to go in and get that stuff and so we can get that cleaned up. Go ahead. It's important to uh, uh, go ahead. One more there. Sorry about that. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Oh, it is starting to go a little. <laughs> um, be ready for the volunteers. As I said, if if you're looking for uh, thinking that it's uh, 20 people and you get over 100, uh, you you're gonna be scrambling the the day of, and it it takes a lot to do this and, and to have people uh, not only come and, and participate, 
but feel that it was worth their time and effort. And you're going to need, uh, like an army that marches on its stomach, so does a, a water cleanup, a river or a lake cleanup. You got to have something uh, for those volunteers, whether that be uh, pizza or hot dogs and brats or burgers or whatever. The, uh, th they're going to be good enough to give you some of their time on a on an evening or a weekend. You should be able to send them home with something in their stomach and and a, a cool water to drink at, at the end of the event. And uh, just a so all that. Logistically, you need to know how many you're going to have ahead of time, so the food and beverages, ice, all that can be planned out for that number of people. Good idea to have a first aid kit or two along. Never had any serious injuries, a few scratches or uh, scrapes, but uh, knock on wood in 13 years of doing it, nobody seriously injured in any of the three state efforts that I've been involved with, and uh, just stress that that safety first before they do anything else and uh, make sure that they come back with it as in good a shape as as when they left the, the takeoff site and it's always important to check people in to the event uh, have somebody that does nothing but follow do the registration and then know where that crew uh, is deployed to and then when they come back with the stuff that they've collected check them out that they are back and, and everything is fine and uh, the boats are back on the trailers, the, all the trucks came back, et cetera, et cetera. So you don't have somebody out there that uh, doesn't doesn't get back to the your takeoff point because they had a, a battery go uh, bad on their boat or the truck wouldn't start uh, again when they're out someplace. So if you have cell phone numbers or whatever, have a way to contact them if they're not back by the uh, time that you've sent set in advance for them to be back, then start checking in with them, where you're at, what's going on or whatever. And then uh, just the, the items that you need for the cleanup, make sure you have a supply of trash bags. Uh, we generally bundle those up in, in rolls of 10 or 12 bags for each crew and depending on where they're going, sometimes we'll give them, we know they're in a bad area or a, one that's really, really filthy. We'll give them uh, two bundles, fi figuring that they're going to come fill 20 bags or 20 bags plus at, at that one spot. Other places where we know it's a little bit lighter, you can send them uh, less bags corresponding to what you, you saw in those areas when you uh, were scouting. Go ahead. We've based the, uh, this is from the Pier 4, Pier 1 again, really important as you're doing it and hours before you set up to make sure that people know what's going on. Have it high visibility so people that are driving by can see that what they don't have to wonder what's happening. They, as that banner says, it's the uh, Missouri River cleanup and it's, you can generally find businesses that uh, will make those banners and as long as they can put some of their, uh, their product on part of the banner, uh, they'll do the rest of it for you for, for no cost. Important to put your partnering agencies on the banner as well. You can see the, the two cities and the Fish and Wildlife Service, the core game fish and parks. We also had an angling group, South Dakota Walleyes Unlimited has been a partner with this one since it started in 2009. So a good way to recognize the people that are involved. Go ahead. They're gonna find some unusual things out there. Uh, some stuff that you won't even see while you're scouting. Uh, vacuum cleaner was found in the uh, upper left-hand photo. A uh, piece of a hay shed or a building after some of our high water events here uh, was found and, and uh, recovered and, and gotten out of the river. Good idea to have some of those uh, swimming pool cleaning nets because a lot of is uh, located a little bit offshore and makes it easier and safer for somebody to reach in with a long handled net to get a pop bottle or a wrapper out of the, the, the lake or the river without having to, to go actually go into the water. And uh, believe it or not, we have, re we have found two boats in nine years or 11 years, I should say, uh, in the 
one here in Pier and Fort Pier, this little duck boat. We also found a canoe uh, that was abandoned and, and, and got that off the lake shore. So we were worried that young kids would find those crafts and, and take a cruise at where they may not come back from. So we got those game fish and parks, took both of those watercrafts and put them on the, the state uh, surplus auction then uh, at the end of the year because neither craft was claimed and they, we could not find through registration, find the uh, past owners of those uh, two boats. Next one. You need a place to put the stuff. Uh, if you go and collect it and have no, no, then what are you going to do if you have boat full or or uh, trucks full of, of trash? So working with the city of Pier through their solid waste facility, they bring these three roll-off containers. They want us to sort the trash into the different categories. Uh, trash or garbage in one, what's called rubble, which is lumber and uh, other building materials in one and scrap metal in the third one. Go ahead, Zach. The bins are set up in a way that uh, trucks and boats can literally drive right next to them if they've been off site. Uh, or when the boats come back in and, and put the boat back on the trailer, then the uh, people that have been in that boat can uh, uh, just simply drive up right next to the, the bin and unload and, and makes it uh, much quicker and much more efficient. To, to get the trash offloaded off of the boats or out of the, the trucks that have been out. Go ahead. Here's the uh, the reward part. We always try to set up a, a good meal for the volunteers. We do the Pier 4 Pier 1 on a Wednesday night. It works very well. So we have a picnic supper in Griffin Park when the uh, people come back from doing their uh, whatever area they were assigned to and a uh, nice way to end the evening. Go ahead. Important to follow up then too, as I mentioned, the, the bins for the collected trash, recycle items if you can, if they're in uh, recyclable condition, and then uh, make sure that, that that trash you collected will be hauled away. Coordinate with the city or county or a refuse hauler to make sure that that site is, is as clean or cleaner from uh, after you're done than was before you got there. So all that stuff that the volunteers have worked so hard on uh, ends up in, in the right place that is properly disposed of. Most landfills now will not take the tires that you may find. So coordinate with a tire dealer or a tire store ahead of the cleanup. See if you can recycle any of the tires that are found in the cleanup uh, through their facility. We have a, a good one here in Pier and uh, they've taken tires every year that we've done the cleanup in, in this area. So you don't have to pay for the disposal of, of the, any tires that are found. Next one. Get a weight total of what was found and, and then keep track of the number of volunteers. Then circle back with the, the media that you initially contacted about the event. Give them the follow up that we had 109 volunteers that uh, worked from 5.30 until 8 o'clock, and we collected 2.23 tons of, of trash total. And then you can even break it down to the uh, how much scrap metal, how much uh, wood or rubble was collected, and how much litter and trash. Then email those results out to the volunteers that you got emails from. Thank all your partners uh, in an email following with that weight total. And if you're going to do this on a regular basis, you have a, an idea that you want to do this every first Saturday in June, for example, for uh, the next few years on that same water body, right away we send out the totals, do a save the date for the following year. So you get it on people's calendar and, and get people thinking about next year's event already when they're still uh, enthused or fired up about what was just accomplished. Go ahead. Can make a huge difference. Uh, the picture on the left is from the Yankton area cleanup. That was a boat lift that tumbled down the river in the high flood of 2011. That was a picture from 2013, and Fish and Wildlife Service crew found that and got that back so we could dispose of that. And the uh, dumpster picture on the right hand side of the screen is from Omaha Council Bluffs, working with a group called Missouri River Relief. And 
we in one Saturday morning we got over five tons of trash out of that area uh, right south of Omaha Council Bluffs. Next one. What are the results? Obviously, an improved river and improved uh, benefits for the environment, and it benefits fish and wildlife, including the endangered species that I mentioned at the top of the presentation. The birds there are the uh, piping plover; they're threatened, and the fish species is the endangered pallid sturgeon. And obviously, whenever you have threatened or endangered species on a water body, extra care needs to be taking place so those species can continue to try to recover. Next one. Doesn't have to be a major effort. I've been talking about uh, volunteer efforts of 100 plus people. Uh, with the pandemic last year, we did not do the Missouri River Lake Sharp cleanup in here. We didn't do the one in Omaha Council Bluffs and we didn't do the one in Yankton because safety uh, protocols would not allow or uh, big gatherings. So to make a little bit of, a, of an impact and, and do a little benefit, my wife and I just a couple of evenings went out in some of the areas around here in Fort Pier and just the two of us collected over 440 pounds of stuff that you can see on, on my driveway there that was all then disposed of through the city solid waste department and is no longer in the water. So it doesn't have to be 100 plus people to make a difference. Next one. I will uh, yield my time and send it over to Sue, but would look forward to any questions or comments afterwards as uh, time allows. And thank you for your time today. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> um, Sue, if you want to turn on your mic and your camera, we can get you going as well. All right, so this is Sue Nissen. She's one of the co-founders of the group Stop Over Salting uh, up in Minnesota, and she's going to talk a little bit about how you guys got started and uh, what you all do. Thanks so much for inviting me today. I'm talking to you from Edina, Minnesota. We're a first ring suburb of Minneapolis. And uh, in the summer of 2014, I was a brand new Minnesota water steward a community volunteer trained in watershed science, and I was completing my capstone project, which was a rain garden at a local church. And I was helping others in my class with their projects when one of my classmates asked me to be on a water working group at the city of Edina, that was our city. And she was a new commissioner there on the city's energy and environment committee, and she was recruiting. So I and other Edina stewards that happened to be in that class of water stewards said yes. We were excited about working towards cleaner waters. And at the time, we had zero idea where this journey was going to take us. You may be a citizen volunteer with a cause that you'd like to champion. You may be working for a public entity and you would value some citizen involvement. Um, what is the next step for engaged citizens? I'm just going to share with you the story of Stop Over Salting, which is a group of citizens that I'm a part of what our goals and strategies were, some of our accomplishments, um, the help we received along the way, and in some important lessons we learned. Okay, slide two. So our early years focused um, was about finding our focus because we didn't know. Um, as the water group at the city of Edina started meeting, we participated in uh, tabling educational events with the city staff. Uh, those helped to support the public education and outreach uh, requirements that the city had for clean water. We also promoted the city's storm drain stenciling program with all groups and ages, from children to youth to adults and neighborhoods around the city. And we met monthly for a few years to discuss water issues in the community and help with any issues that the city wanted to help with. Most of that experience um, was new to us. We were new to the workings of city government and the moder the Master Waters of Minnesota Water Steward Program was new too. So we were new to the city and these were great opportunities for us to get to know the staff at our city and uh, for them to get to know the volunteers in the community. 
And I'll tell you, we were continually asking them questions. <laughs> but we needed to gain an understanding of how cities operate and how they fit into the bigger picture with other public entities and how and where decisions about water are being made because water goes across all kinds of entities. And most importantly to us, where could we influence? So at the same time as stewards, we had developed um, a growing concern about chloride, uh, specifically road salts. During our training, we had learned the basic of chloride pollution and it had been shocking after hearing about all the troubles with water in our state and then they put chloride on us. The small amount of chloride, just one teaspoon that permanently will pollute five gallons of water and the permanency of that pollution, how tightly chloride attaches to the water molecule. The only way out, the only way to separate that, separate that is reverse osmosis. And we know we are not going to reverse osmosis the state of Minnesota. So now, each successive winter, we were observing the amount of oversalting in our communities around us with growing alarm. And individually, we started some grassroots community outreach, uh, spreading the word about damage to water. The vast majority of people that we talked to had no idea what chloride was up to, aside from making the roads safer. We left flyers at the hardware store to sit alongside pallets of de-icers. We, um, if we went to the Y or the church or everyday errands, we were asking property managers to reduce their use to maybe clean up a spill that we saw or consider going to smart salt training. Um, a Minneapolis steward that we work with wrote a grant to educate business in um, businesses in the community. The work we were doing all it at this point generated a lot more questions and we found a wonderful new group of mentors to help us take a deeper dive into chloride. The first thing we did was we got certified in smart salt training. This is the same training that the professional applicators in Minnesota take, so that now we better understood the best practices for winter maintenance, the role of applicators. We met applicators, heard their side of the salting story. Uh, we also reached out to our local watershed. Our waters were impaired, are impaired in Edina, uh, to the Minnesota Pollution Control, agency and to a great nonprofit, Freshwater Society, who actually started the Master Water Steward Program here. From them, we learned more about chloride locally and statewide, the politics and beliefs about chloride and the threats it was post, uh, posing. We started attending the, re the annual SALT Symposium in Minnesota, which introduces us to larger issues about chloride new directions in the world of salting. And uh, the thing I will never forget about that is hearing the mayor of Madison, Wisconsin, talk about salty water flowing out of their taps. Can you imagine going for a glass of water and tasting salt? And a destroyed wellhead that was going to cost almost $7 million to replace. The professionals in these organizations have continued to mentor us the information and that we learned during these years are, is the basis of the education and outreach efforts we have done. And the relationships that we've formed have continued to evolve. They were key in, in our group. We've become partners with a common goal. But back to the story, why was that extra salt being used? Turns out there are a lot of reasons and it's a complex problem, but it's founded on a belief that more salt means more safety. And Minnesota's public sector, we soon learned, was starting to address oversalting. They were training and they were using new best practices and they were reporting amazing stories of um, reduction. But the private sector applicators rarely attended and, the, and through our community work, through talking to our Y and our church and so on and so forth, we learned why that was. They were, they were concerned about the water. They were fishermen. They liked being on our lakes. They saw the destruction that chloride did to the infrastructure, but there's something about seeing salt. More salt is more pro, uh, protection for liability and lawsuits. And if you see it, that's protection. And property managers were wanting a lot of salt put down. So training really was irrelevant. At that point, we discovered some legislation and that ended up birthing SOS. Okay. 
flip to the next slide. So what was that legislation? Well, it was sitting idle at the Minnesota State Capitol. And the bill did two things. One, it expanded the smart cell training statewide. And two, it provided limited liability for trained certified applicators and property owners when their best practices were documented on a property. So given what we'd learned in our community, we thought it was a pretty good fit for maybe some reduction in the private community. We knew that many others thought that also that this would be a good solution. And at first, we were talking to a number of established organizations in the community, hoping they'd become about, involved. But nobody had the extra bandwidth to push this issue. They thought it was important, but we learned a really important lesson. Boards of nonprofits are going to set directions for that organization. They only have so much time, they only have so much money, and they might be concerned about something, but it doesn't make the cut. And chloride has been one of those. Um, so with the encouragement of the mentors I told you about, and a lot of work with Freshwater, we identified a core group of six stewards. We organized our group Stop Over Salting with the uh, goal of bringing the legislation forward. And um, I would echo something that Paul said, be involved with other people. I mean, it's taken a lot of work and we needed a lot of support and having friends and other people like-minded around you is really important. So our strategic organization was next. It was really important for us to be clear on our goal and our messaging. Now our goal from the beginning was simply to reduce over application and therein lies our name. We didn't we weren't advocating reduced salt use. A lot of people were scared that might be the case. Salts play an important role in winter safety and soft water and reducing dust on roads. And we didn't want any confusion on that issue. Uh, it was gonna be hard enough just to get some, um, the over application reduced. So we named ourselves Stop Over Salting. We also wanted to drive home that destructive power of just a little bit of chloride, that teaspoon. And so we decided, uh, we bought a whole bunch of teaspoons. We could have made a lot of muffins out of these, okay? But this is the amount of chloride that permanently pollutes uh, five gallons of water. And we knew our audience had no idea. So uh, we put them on a lanyard. We started wearing them around our neck. It was something we could talk about. We left them as leave behinds. They were all over the Capitol. Every time we did an education event, we had these. And pretty soon people were calling us up and asking to have our spoons. Okay, uh, slide four. Staying informed was critical. We were entering the world of legislation and that world works on information and we were newcomers. So we really expanded the number of people we talked to with informational interviews. We went beyond our core mentors and now we had to understand how bills were passed. We talked to conservation organizations, uh, business organizations and their associations, lobbyists, former legislators, watersheds. What do you think? Will you support it? Who should be considered as authors? Who should not? Who else should we be talking to? We continued our education and training, learning more and uh, interacting with the training community and our mentors because they were all interested and believed in the legislation. We learned early on the value of attending public meetings. Our first experience was a series of town halls that um, kicked off Governor Dayton's new clean water initiative. He had five of them around the state and he sent his commissioners and his staff and citizens were invited to come in in round tables and bring their water concerns forward to his staff and his um, commissioners. So SOS, we attended three of those five meetings, fanning out around the room, meeting people, totally surprising the governor's water advisor by bringing up chloride pollution. I mean, she knew about it, but nobody had ever brought it up to her before, especially a citizen. At the round table discussions, we brought up the data on the existing chloride pollution in the state. Uh, we offered the limited liability uh, legislation as one solution that could start to reduce it. And we asked if there was a commissioner at our table, we asked for reductions in their agencies. The reports from those town hall meetings show that chloride was an important concern. 
I think public meetings are a great way to get your message out. Um, there are connections to be made, not only to other, with others that attend, but it's a great opportunity to see decision makers in action before, say, an upcoming one-on-one -on -one meeting. Uh, there are all kinds of open meetings. Um, now they're on Zoom, uh, town halls uh, around water issues at every level of government. And we also were constantly identifying and reassessing our strategies. It was about oversalting. Uh, we, when we met, we met every couple of weeks for a long time. My dining room was full of pieces of paper on the wall. And this, there were strategies, people we needed to contact. We never stopped feeding into that process of informational interviews, training, talking with our mentors, attending meetings, and reassessing our goals. Okay, slide five, please. Um, when we started talking about chloride, as I told you, very few people knew about it. And um, it, it turned out they were about as shocked as we had been. They, there were lots of questions coming at us and we learned um, to make sure that early on in a conversation, we would get our message out um, and then we would leave behind a fact sheet. And depending on the audience, that fact sheet needed to vary. For the legislators, uh, there was a short fact sheet for session when they didn't have much time and a more in-depth fact sheet for other times. Uh, for a, something to leave behind with a property manager was different than what a lake association might want. A township had different needs than a church. We also, there was more happening in chloride. Articles were being written. We were generating things. Other organizations were generating things, but there was no one place that you could find them. So we'd talk to people and leave a meeting, and if they wanted more information, we had nowhere to direct them. So we put up a website and simply put all the links on there so we could direct people to one place. Okay, slide six, please. We needed supporters. We knocked on a lot of doors asking for support. Some of those doors remain closed. Some opened, but very grudgingly. And then there were those like the city of Edina who welcomed us in. We knew that the support of cities was gonna be important for this bill. And we went to our city staff and they guided us through the process of taking a resolution to council. We drafted a document with the rationale to support the resolution and the, the resolution document itself. Uh, they were both passed by the Energy Environment Committee, the one Luann had been a commissioner on, and we presented before the council. They were the first public entity to support the legislation, and we've always been very grateful for that support. Um, they showed us how to go through the process, and they had our backs. Um, that resolution we were able to take to other public entities uh, who also supported the legislation. Slide seven, please. The legislative work needed um, a reach that was local and statewide and across the aisle. Minnesota has the only divided legislature in the country. A coalition was formed, a core group of organizations. Uh, sometimes SOS took the lead, sometimes other organizations took the lead. Communication to the wider group of people that weren't involved in the day-to-day -day, uh, lobbying was something that uh, our organization took on. The picture of the people, is that's the day that the, um, the legislation passed the House. And uh, let's see, third from the right is Peter Fisher, our lead author in the House. Um, from our research, the pieces of paper on my dining room wall, we had identified authors. Uh, it ended up, um, our representative from Edina was one of our lead authors, and we, we just did a really good job of finding authors around the state, and as citizens going and talking to them and telling them why we would like them to support our bill. We learned how important the citizen voice is. There's lots of lobbyists at the Capitol, but the citizen voice is unique and we had had experience in our communities and good support for why this bill was a good, was, um, could be successful. Um, so we were in a unique position um, to talk to legislators. We did, uh, we 
we did talk in committee and we learned how to do uh, presentations in committee. Um, it's been quite a journey to go through the legislative work. Okay, slide eight. You can tell how important relationships have been to us. We've had so, so much help along the way. And our response has been giving back. One of the things we really like to do is celebrate organizations that are successful with winter maintenance best practices. And this picture is my local school district because after they went to training, they turned it around. And I walk that campus almost every day and they need very little salt to keep. There's four, build, four school buildings there and they keep them open and they don't report any higher incidents of slip and falls and they're using best practices. It's wonderful and I like to promote them anytime I can. Um, because we are local at our core, we can see what's going on in our communities and bring ideas forward. Uh, we, this has led to being a part of the new property management, smart salting training, developing model contracts and or ordinances, commenting on plans. Because of the relationships that we've developed over the, the past years, we feel like we're a part of this process, welcomed in and part of bringing about change. We rarely say no. We're always saying yes to, can you do this? Okay, last slide, please. So if you have something you're passionate about and you'd like to bring forward, what, do you, what can you do? I'd say start local, learn, develop a clear message, tell your story and advocate for change. Be professional, find mentors, be a mentor, get a few successes under your belt, look for opportunities continually, and don't be afraid to pick up the phone or show up a meeting at a meeting and ask. Say yes a lot and have fun. In the end, Stop Over Salting has raised awareness on chloride issues, but whether we have accomplished our goal of reduction, uh, we think is doubtful. After four years, the legislation has not passed Minnesota legislature and over application still abounds. But um, the process of working on this legislation has definitely raised awareness throughout the state about the sources of chloride. More than road salts now is being talked about. It's on the radar at the legislature, at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. In our municipalities, they no longer say, all anybody says is put down more salt. We haven't heard about reducing salt. They've heard it now. <laughs> Stop over salting has been an integral part, um, people have told us, in bringing the issue of chlorides forward. We have a passion for it, and but we see it as we're all pushing this um, issue forward together. We have felt one of our advantages is being focused. All we do is worry about chloride. A lot of people have other issues they need to work on. Um, so I would encourage you, if you're in volunteering, to stay focused on what is important to your heart. Thank you, and uh, take questions. Right. Paul, if you want to turn your, your, your back, that was quick. <laughs> um, and looks like you're still muted. If you want to turn your mic back on, I'll read a couple questions here but uh, i want to start out saying uh, definitely a big thanks to paul and sue for uh taking the time to come on today really like both you guys' presentations um and thank you everyone in the audience for joining us and i'm gonna read off some of these questions um sue amy asked well she said awesome work sue you have so many resources strategies resources and strategies it'd be useful to be able to access and use with your permission such as your website address, documents, flyers, et cetera. Would you be willing to share something like that? Sure. And I have to admit, um, the last few years, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has, their website has just expanded and become wonderful. So we've pulled ours down because they're doing a great job. But I'm happy to, if, if you want to facilitate contact, I'm happy to send resources. Sure. I think I have Amy's email address. I can get you two in touch. Um, 
Paul, I remember we had a question for you up here um, referring to uh, you're talking about specific legislation this year at the beginning of your presentation, Paul, referring to number 1256. Uh, how can you follow up on money that was used? Or good, how can you follow up on how the money was used? Sorry. Yeah, good, good question. Uh, there is accountability in the bill. Uh, part of the money will be it. No group can get funds from this special appropriation unless they apply for those funds through the, uh, the Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And then those applications will be reviewed by a 30 member non-point source task force, which ironically I also sit on. <laughs> but uh, that, that task force will review those applications and come back to the agency then with funding recommendations for those local projects. And then it will be uh, funded through that state agency and all the accounting practices will apply. So uh, a good question. Yes, there is accountability to the program. Um, this is for Sue, I believe. Um, and he, I think you kind of alluded to this, but do you only focus on road salts or do you look at, or do you talk about water softeners as well? Uh, I would say 80% of it is road salts, uh, but we do talk about water softener. We have educated softeners. We have educated at the state fair. I mean, it, every legislator's office that you go into, you know, they're, they're, they want to talk about water softeners too. So, yeah, <laughs> it's just starting to reach the point that um, there's some action steps we can see on water softeners. Awesome. And um, sorry, this isn't a specific question. I just want to make a comment to uh, the audience that um, I'm trying to post something in the chat here. Okay. Um, we, the Isaac Walton League Clean Water Program, just uh, this past month published an advocacy guide. It's, um, we, we work with Save Our Streams uh, water quality monitoring, but it's intended for people who do water quality monitoring or if you are aware of and interested in advocating, um, even if you don't monitor, you can use other data or if you're aware of an issue, um, we created this nice advocacy guide that I just posted in the chat um, as kind of a guide to help people, you know, figure out where to get started and who to contact. Um, and it covered things that you guys talked about today. So I think that this is uh, a great addition to, uh, to the webinar as well. So um, if you guys are interested in that, it's at the bottom of the link I just sent. And it looks like we had another question just come in. And someone's asking, Sue, do you know of any plants that take up salt? I have a legislator that would love to know that too. Um, <laughs> Instead of it going to the streets, can someone plant something that can help absorb it? Um, I don't. I have one of our team members sitting over here, but I don't. Plants take successfully daylilies. He says daylilies. I'm not sure. I, there, I I honestly can't remember to tell you the truth. <laughs> uh, pheasants forever here in South Dakota. We have uh, very salty or alkali so soils, especially on uh, fields that are irrigated in the corners of those fields and. Uh, They'll get so salty that the topsoil is actually white. Pheasants Forever has found some grass species that they can plant in those uh, areas that do well in this in that saline soil and will take the, so the salt out of the soil. So there are some plants that not only uh, can survive a salty environment but thrive on it. So does that actually take the salt out of the soil then? Because when the yes. plant dies, what happens? Uh, the plant doesn't die. These grasses oh. can live on in that alkali soil. Okay, that would be great information to know. I'll, I'll see if I can find some species and send them to you. Perfect. Yeah, that might also be something that you could contact your local university extension office about. They would have Correct. information yep. for wherever wherever you are locally. Uh, another good source is uh, your greenhouse or nursery. Ask them what uh, a salt tolerant plant. Yeah. Um, all right, well, it's 1.10 here in Central Time. Um, 
I know we've still got some people on, but uh, I want to be respectful of folks' time and let them get on with their day. Um, if you guys have specific questions, you can email us. Um, let me open up the chat. It's just SOS, which is save our streams. So SOS at IWLA.org. Uh, if you've got questions that didn't get answered or specific follow-up with Paul or Sue, um, you can send it to that email address and I can forward it onto them. Um, we can hopefully get those answered and uh, help you out. So just as a reminder, this was recorded and we'll send out a link to the YouTube video of the recording in the next day or so. Um, and any questions or thoughts or follow up again, just send, send an email to sos at iwla.org. Um, and just wanna say thank you to all of our folks in the audience for joining us today. And especially big thank you to Paul and Sue for taking the time not only to present, but to um, get these presentations ready today and hop on and, and practice beforehand and everything. Um, uh, I really appreciate it, and thanks for what you provided for our audience today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, folks. Well, with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. So, hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day today, and thanks for joining us.